new year, new live stream, new region and new video. Hello everybody, today we will talk about what we saw and learned about Genshin Impact version 4.4 from the live stream. So this is gonna be the analysis of the trailer, of the rest of the live stream, but also a summary of everything we already know about Shenyu Vale. And of course, there will be some interesting theories in this video as well. This is a theory video, I will use information available in the game and in this case in the live stream, but my theories and conclusions are not to be considered the official lore of the game, unless I got something right and it's confirmed in a little update of the game itself. With the disclaimer out of the way, I think it's time to begin with our analysis of the Genshin Impact version 4.4 live stream. Let's start this video with the analysis of the trailer. The first and extremely interesting scene we see is either and Lumin eating together, probably during the festivities. Of course, that's not gonna happen, we won't fall for that. I noticed that the Honkai Star Rail update that came out a few days after Fontaine was released had the same Ace Detective gameplay we saw in the Opera IP class. Considering that the upcoming Star Rail update takes place in Penacony, the land of dreams, where dreams are so real that they become reality, in Genshin Impact we will probably end up in some kind of dreamscape that, together with what Cloud Retainer said about the Lantern Ride being a day of reunion, will trap either in this dream in which his biggest wish will come true, so being reunited with Lumine. We already experienced something similar in 2.8 with the Cognitive Mimicry device during the Summertime Odyssey, which turned dreams into reality, so this theory is actually possible. We're also getting a Nahida rerun and she rules over dreams, so this may be actually connected. Going back to the trailer, we hear someone say I don't know, I don't remember. I have a theory, although a very easy one to come up with. Both in Baiju's character story 5 and in the Echoes of an Offering Artifact set, we learned of two Adepti, the owner of the mountain and her friend who made a pact. They promised each other that once the tea trees had grown, they would have met for a banquet. Sadly, this banquet never happened because one Adeptus sank into the water and never came back to the surface, while the owner of the mountain lost all her fingers and couldn't even gather the tea leaves but above all, they both lost their memories of the past. We learned from the livestream that the main Adeptus in this new update will be Fujin, a Koi Carp, one of the Adepti mentioned in the artifact set. Specifically, the Soul Scent Bloom talks about a young lady, most likely the owner of the mountain, who was struggling ashore when the orchestrator of her suffering poked their head out of the water. Since this being had rainbow scales on its body that glimmered in the light and later sank into the depth never to come back to the surface, this should be Fujin, the Koi Adeptus. Now talking about the name Fujin, it has nothing to do with the Japanese god Fujin, and according to Google Translate, so not the best translator out there, it means floating brocade. A brocade is a kind of decorative fabric made with colored silks and sometimes gold and silver threads, which would fit the description of this scarf with glimmering scales, while for the floating, well it's a fish so that makes sense. Back to the trailer, the next scene is probably still related to the Koi Adeptus since it's a device that looks like it's underwater, although I'm not sure how we will go down there since we can dive underwater only in Fontaine. Next, we see a pavilion on top of a mountain close to Huaguan Stone Forest, but we're gonna talk about it later in the video. And then we see either crying, and at this point, I can only think that it's gonna happen once he realizes that his meeting with Lumine was just a dreamscape. Now, this next line I alone am the source of this sin is once again very interesting. The voice actress is the same as the I don't know, I don't remember from before, so it's the Koi Adeptus. The developers also decided not to give us any info about her since the voice actress is not listed in the description of the video. Now I don't know if you'll agree with this theory I've had for quite some time, but I think that the owner of the mountain, the friend of the Koi Adeptus, may actually be Changsheng. 
In Baiju's character story 5, he says that talking about the past with Changsheng is basically useless because she doesn't remember a thing, not even the contract she has to have with the humans to survive. Which sounds like she lost her memories, just like the owner of the mountain from the legend, who interestingly lost all her fingers, which could clearly mean that she turned into something else, like a snake perhaps, an animal that obviously doesn't have fingers. Furthermore, the name of the contract is Way of the Dragon Dragon Jade Snake, and there is a myth in China about koi fish that try to swim up a waterfall. One day, the demons noticed it, and they made the waterfall even higher, so the koi fish simply gave up and went with the current, all except for one. It kept trying to swim up the waterfall for a hundred years, and finally it made it. The gods noticed its tenacity and its victory, so they turned it into a dragon as a reward. Now, I'm not an expert on Chinese folklore, but I guess this is the legend they picked as a reference for Hu Jin, the Koi Adeptus, especially since there is a waterfall in Chen Yu Vale as well. If I'm right about this, then the way of the dragon, Dragon Jade Snake, would make more sense, since we have both the dragon, the victorious Koi Fish, and the snake, Changsheng. The fact that the Koi Adeptus said that she alone was the source of the sin makes me think that the tragic ending of the legend, so the Koi Adeptus sinking and the owner of the mountain losing her fingers, may be the result of something the Koi Adeptus did after the pact. Who knows, maybe even the fact that Changsheng needs to have a contract with a human to survive may be part of the sin that the Koi Adeptus is talking about. Later in the livestream, and I may be wrong about this, we got to see Mount Lingmen, the place where the Kuhua clan originated from. And the name of the mountain is very similar to the Longmen, the Dragon Gate, located at the top of the waterfall on a legendary mountain. The legend here is similar to the one we talked about before. The carps couldn't swim upstream in the river because the currents were too strong, so they complained to Yu the Great. His wife, the Jade Emperor's daughter, explained the problem to her father, so he promised her that the carps that were able to swim upstream and leap over the waterfall of the Yellow River would be transformed into dragons and fly off into the sky. Lastly in the trailer, we get to see the new boss, the Solitary Swani, which by the way is so cute, and we can see that it can use both Animal and Hydro, and its colors change in relation to the element it's using. This particular Swanni is believed to be the original master of the land and it's related to the Adepti. It used to roam freely on the mountains, although it looked down with disdain at the inhabitants of the place. When peace was achieved in Chinyu Vale, the Swanni decided to live in seclusion in the mountains and it drives off whoever disturbs its slumber. Gaming's Mantai, the little lion or Diting that accompanies him, is also a Swanni. Now that we're done with the trailer, let's analyze what has been said in the rest of the livestream. First of all, we learned, well we already knew about it actually, that Chen Yu Vale is the land of tea and cool spring waters. Very important is the cauldron, an adeptal mechanism used to roast the tea leaves. Since it's an adeptal mechanism, I think it's fair to think it's one of Cloud Retainer's creations. As the land of tea, the mountains behind the main town, Chaoyan village, are entirely covered with tea fields. Chen Yu Vale seems to be very big, so let's try to figure out how big this area is actually going to be. For example, we can see in this section of the livestream this very peculiar waterfall, and if you're not new on this channel, you probably immediately recognized it since I've been showing it to you since before Fontaine was released. You see this tower that we use to defeat the Nassim Withering Zones? Well, this is the same tower in Motima Forest that I used multiple times to try and figure out, and fail to do so, where Fontaine was gonna be, and from this tower we can see the exact same waterfall. On the map, this is where the waterfall is going to be, and you can also see it from Fontaine as well. Still talking about the geography of Chen Yu Vale, we learn the Yilong Wharf, the port above and below this other waterfall, is a transportation and trading hub, and because of its location, it trades with both Liyue and Fontaine under the protection of the Sword and Strongbox Secure Transport Agency. Through the livestream, we can pinpoint the exact location of Yilong Wharf. From Lumidus Harbor in Fontaine, we can travel straight to Yilong Wharf. There, we can use a huge mechanism to climb down the waterfall, where we can sail through the Great River that cuts the entirety of Chenyu Vale in half. 
I believe that the Great River ends more or less here, near Chinza village, for two reasons. It actually makes sense on the map, but also because Augustus Lovelace told us that he departed from Lubinus Harbor, traveled through Chenyu Vale, and then he reached Chinza village, so Chayon village, which is in northern Liyue, should be close to Chinza village as well. Anyway, a key feature of the Great River is the Jade Mouth, a massive piece of jade made by the Adepti that somehow protects the people from flooding. Remember the Long Men, the Dragon Gate from before? Doesn't it sound like a reference to this Jade Mouth? Oh, and by the way, I think Elon Wharf is going to be somewhere around here, considering Fontaine in the background in the scene of the livestream, while Chayon Village is potentially going to be on this island near Chinza Village. Next, we are shown two more places, Yaojie Valley, the abode of the white snake, and Mount Xuanlian, the abode of the carp. Well, if you think about it, this sounds like a confirmation about what I said about Fujin and Changsheng. Anyway, about Yaojie Valley, we can see a purple tint, and whenever we see that color, it usually means that there is some kind of abyssal power corrupting the place, and in the livestream we were told that the waters and soil of Chen Yu Vale had begun to change and the tea was losing its scent, so these two issues may be related. We were also told that we will have to follow the Adeptus' guidance to resolve the crisis, so I guess this may be Cloud Retainer's character quest. When it comes to Mount Xuanlian, we can actually figure out where it is. We can see the same Sumeru watchtower from before, and if you watch carefully, you can see a pavilion on one of these stone pillars, but also a little floating island near it. We were shown these two places again a little later in the livestream, the floating island with the waypoint and this pavilion with koi statues, and it's clear that we are west of Mount Atsang. This is also the same pavilion we saw earlier near Huaguan Stone Forest. This means that these pillars here that we've been watching for so long, wondering what they were, are going to be Mount Xuanlian, the abode of the Carp Adeptus. Lastly, we were shown Qishang Wall, which is to the south of Chen Yu Vale. This place is said to be the ruins of a bygone conflict. Since we learned that the Swan Ni went into seclusion when Chen Yu Vale achieved peace, it must mean that this place has seen its fair amount of battles or even wars, so maybe something happened here during the Archon War. Anyway, we can clearly see a statue of the Seven, and considering that we are close to the Tower of Epsistemus, but also the position of these two mountains in Fontaine, Shishan Wall should be somewhere around here on the map, and here if we look for it from Fontaine. In the end, the entirety of Chen Yu Vale should cover this section of the map, so it's going to be pretty huge. If you're wondering what's gonna be in this empty section between Sumeru, Chen Yu Vale and Fontaine, this is most likely where Baida Harbor, the unreleased port on Sumeru, is going to be. Now will these pins on my map be in the right place? Well, we'll know soon enough. By the way, Hoyoverse published this map after I recorded this video, and it seems that I got the location of Chayon Village and of the end of the Great River right. And just for fun, this is how I drew the map for the video. We just covered everything that we saw and heard in the livestream, so let's talk about what we already knew about Chen Yu Vale. One of the countless legends about Chen Yu Vale talks about a jade slab capable of conjuring sweet rains that caught the attention of the demons. So the master of the mountain split it in many parts and with different shades, and hid them underwater, in the hills and in shrines. Since these ornaments bear the blessing of a deity's pact, I think the master of the mountain mentioned in this artifact is a different being from the owner of the mountain we talked about before, so it may very well be the old god that ruled over Chen Yu Vale, meaning that the story potentially predates Rex Lapis's arrival. The sacrificial jade tells us about the time when Rex Lapis arrived in Chen Yu Vale for the first time. There, he found out that the inhabitants of the land had reverted back into tribes scattered amongst the hills. Chen Yu Vale used to be ruled by an ancient god who perished in foreign lands. Now, we have three options here. It could be an unknown god that we will never learn about. It could be Remus, since he reached Fontaine from the east, so more or less from Chen Yu Vale, but I have my doubts about it. My last option, the one I somehow believe to be the right one, is that this god was Orobashi. We know that he fought Morax and lost, so he left this land and tried fighting someone else, the twin gods from Inazuma, only to lose again. 
Maybe Chishan Wall is what's left of Abashi's fight against Morax, turning the land into the ruins of a bygone conflict. Back to the sacrificial jade, the people back then used to throw jade into the waters as obeisance to commemorate the long silent messengers of the cerulean sky. I don't know about you, but this is screaming envoys of Celestia and the floating island is not even that far away from Chenyu Vale since it seems to be above what I believe to be Petri Shore. Maybe and hopefully we will find a ton of information about the Envoy Age in Chenyu Vale. Now back to the story again, Rex Lapis took over Chen Yu Vale, the people slowly stopped working on jade and began cultivating tea trees. They also stopped throwing jade into the waters, but they still go to Yilong Wharf to commemorate their ancestors and the dead, so Yilong Wharf is probably going to be way more important than a simple pour beneath a waterfall. Rex Lapis then obviously met the supernatural beings that lived there, who signed a contract with him and became Adepti. Rex Lapis most likely went to Chen Yu Vale together with another Adeptus, who later gifted one of these new Adepti a chalice with a realm within inside. So I think that this was Street War Rambler, Madame Ping. Since the spring inside the chalice never dried up, it was a fine temporary place for the recipient of this gift. So I believe that the main character here is Fujin, the Koi Adeptus, who would need water to survive since, you know, it's a fish. This story obviously takes place after the Archon War because Fujin talked about the Yakshas and about Liyue Harbor. What's interesting is that because Fujin inherited the ancient rites, of which we know nothing about, the price to pay was never to be able to spend too much time on land, so maybe it was these ancient rites that turned her into a fish. Anyway, the two Adepti set off on a journey with the chalice in their hand toward Liyue Harbor, so the Street War Rambler could introduce Fujin to her old friends, the other Adepti. When Fujin came back, the owner of the mountain, who, like I said before, I believe to be Changsheng, was still deciding what to plant in the fields, which makes sense since she was also known as the Herb Lord. But Fujin had already planted a tea tree without her permission, so she promised the owner of the mountain that she would cut the leaves, make tea, and invite Cloud Retainer and Mountain Shaper, whom she had met in Liyue Harbor. Later, someone tied the jade pendant to the branches of Fujin's small tea tree, but this is also when some kind of tragedy happened to the two Adepti friends. When the owner of the land came back, so she left the place at some point, she had lost her fingers and she couldn't untie the jade pendant, nor could she gather the tea leaves. As I said before, I believe this to be the moment Chan Sheng was turned into a wild snake. When it comes to Fujin instead, I think the Flowing Rings artifact explains her story. It talks about a gem that fell into the hands of a demon and was then thrown into the waters where it sank. This gem is said to have come from a sacred mountain and that Rex Lapis shaped it into its current shape, so it may mean that she inherited the ancient rites from Rex Lapis and turned it into a koi fish. I believe this gem to be Fujin for three reasons. First, the story says that the gem could be anything, a lesser jade, a simple cup, or even a beautiful person. Second, the story of the artifact ends with another legend, one that is very similar to the Chinese one about the koi fish becoming dragons that we talked about before. The legend in the artifact says that many koi left their lakes and flew away into the wind, so did these jade earrings of a certain person who changed their form. Third, the gem was taken by a demon and was later thrown into the water where it sank, just like the Koya that the sank and never resurfaced. Now that we're done with what we knew about Chen Yu Vale, let's end this video with some predictions. We will learn about Fujin and we will probably meet her since we heard her voice in the trailer. Two options here. She's either dead and we will talk with her consciousness, or we will have to free her from whatever has kept her prisoner underwater, preventing her from resurfacing. We didn't see any other enemy boss except for the Swanee, so I doubt we will fight the demon from the legend. My other prediction is extremely easy. Chen Yu Vale is going to be amazing. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you're interested in Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. My next video will be, of course, about the story in version 4.4, so once I'm done with the quests and the exploration, I'll come back for a detailed analysis. 
Obviously, I'm going to pull for Xiangyan, but this time I already know that I'm getting her since I lost the 50-50 for Navia. Still, if you're pulling for her, and I guess most of you will, considering that her gameplay seems extremely fun, good luck! Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, over and out!